Thank you. The first thing I'll do, of course, is share my slides. Please. <laughs> oh, well. I hope you can all see that. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. And because this is Zoom and I will get no feedback, I won't know whether you're nodding off. I shall just plow on steadily unless someone tells me otherwise. So today's talk, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the bats, um, bats in general, so bats around the world and where they fit in to the animal kingdom. And then a little bit about the bats that we expect to find in Northern England. Um, I think you'll realize quite quickly that I think bats are fascinating. Um, so we should all love our bats. Uh, so I'll just start. So you might never, uh, or, and they did tell me that this had to be very basic because many of you may not know much at all about bats. And I hope that's correct. Because if you do know quite a lot about bats, you might find this a bit boring, but let's hope not. So um, you might never have thought about bats, but the first question we always ask is, well, what is a bat? And it, it's interesting because they are all quite small and they have fur. They have fur because they're mammals, of course, and because they're mammals, they suckle their young. And a bat, a, a young bat is a pup. And the thing that's special about bats is that they fly and they fly with their hands, basically, because their wings are just giant hands. So all the power of a bat is in its forelimbs, not its rear limbs. And believe it or not, there are over 1,400 different species across the world. So it's the second largest group of mammals apart from rodents. Um, when I got involved, I think we knew of about nearly a thousand species. So we are finding new species. That doesn't mean there are more bats. It just means that what we what was previously considered a single species might have been divided into more than one. And we do find new species as well. So they range in size. Uh, this is the smallest bat in the world, and it, you can see how small it is that it's hanging from someone's finger there. Uh, and it's called the bumblebee bat because that's the size of it. It's um, an insect eating bat that's found in limestone caves in Thailand and fully grown, it weighs two grams. So that's a mammal that has live young and suckles its young and flies to catch its food and everything it needs is packed into two grams. That alone should, it's certainly gobsmacking to me. So that's the smallest bat in the world, the bumblebee bat. The largest bat in the world is this one. So there's not a great range of sizes. And this one is a, a bat of um, Malaysia, the golden crowned flying fox. And flying foxes are very different than a lot of the, the bats that we have here because they're not, um, they don't, they don't echolocate, they don't find their way by sound. They um, hunt at dusk and dawn with big eyes and they hang conspicuously in trees. Uh, and they, they are fruit eaters. So this is a fruit eating bat. So that's the range that we've got. And just to tell you, just to show you where bats fit into the taxonomic tree, bats come under the class of mammals and they are in their own order. So they're not clusters, uh, although the name of bats in a lot of languages is flying mice or that kind of thing, bald mouse in French. They aren't rodents, they are in their own order. And the order is called Chiroptera. And that word chiroptera means hand wing because bats fly with giant hands. And I hope you can see, I like this picture because it's really obvious that that is just a giant hand with a thumb here, five fingers, an arm, an elbow, up to a shoulder. So that's what the word means, hand wing. And even on our local bats, this is a pipistrelle, which is one of our local bats. You can still tell that they are just giant hands. Uh, and that all the power of a bat is in those arms rather than in the legs. This is the bone structure, um, bat on the left, human arm on the right, and you can see the bones are exactly the same, just the proportions are different. And bats have been around for a long time, so we find fossils of bats that are many millions of years old, 55 million years old, and the structure, the body structure of that animal is 
basically the same as a modern day bat. So bats evolved a long time ago. There were probably flying bats on the earth when there were still dinosaurs on the earth. So that's quite interesting that it's such a successful body shape. And if you think about bats at all, you probably think about this. This is a bat, you know, with its leathery wings wrapped around it. They're not leathery, actually, they're just skin. But that's what people think about with their wings wrapped around, hanging out in the open, uh, just ready to pounce on your neck. Of course, they're fruit bats. They're all fruit bats. And they're only found in tropical countries, Australia, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, those kind of places. They're called the mega chiroptera because they're large and they're all fruit eaters. And they provide many ecosystem services, not just the fruit eating bats, but all bats provide ecosystem services, which are the things that animals do that benefit humans. Aside from making me excited. So one of the things they do is pollination. And you can see this little bat here. Um, it's a nectar feeding bat. It's going to stick its head in that uh, cactus flower and drink the nectar. When it does that, it takes some pollen onto its fur, goes to the next flower and pollinates the cactus. And that kind of pollination service by nectar eating bats um, is responsible for this fruit, which some of you may recognize. This is a durian fruit. This is, these are fruits grown in Southeast Asia. I understand it's a bit of a mar, I've never had tried one, but I understand it's a marmite type fruit. You either love it or hate it because it's got a very pungent smell. But it's worth about $250 million to the economy of Southeast Asia. So it is quite important. Uh, and the flowers of the durian plant are very pale and they actually flower at night. So you can imagine why that has evolved uh, to be pollinated by a bat. A nectar eating bat, and it's this little guy, the cave nectar bat, which um, lives in caves and comes out at, at night to feed on the nectar of the durian plant, among other things. Another one that's uh, quite an important bat is the Mexican long-tongued bat, which uh, here it's uh, got its head in a saguaro cactus flower. But it's also, and you can see that it's evolved perfectly for its head to fit exactly in there and for the pollen to get around its shoulders as it comes out. This bat also pollinates the agave cactus, which some of you may have heard of. And when it's been a pollinating, this is what it looks like. The face full of pollen takes the nectar, moves to the next flower and pollinates that flower. And of course, the blue agave cactus is used in Mexico to make this. So that's a very important species. And in fact, there are um, lots of plants that rely on bats um, for, uh, for pollination. So bats actually pollinate and disperse the seeds of about 110 plant species used to produce food and drink. And some plants that are used to produce medicine, uh, some that produce timber, balsa wood, for example, uh, fiber, cordage, dyes, tannins, and even some that render animal feed. Bats also, of course, do seed dispersal and uh, fruit eating bats anyway. Uh, and there are even trees that, that generate faster, that germinate faster, if the seed comes out of the back end of a bat first. So um, it deposits the seed in its own little packet of fertilizer. And also, of course, bats eat fruit in one place and the poo comes out elsewhere. So they are very important in the regeneration of forests in tropical areas where, where they take the seeds. The main thing that we know bats for, and probably the main thing, is insect control, of course. And this example here is the Congress Bridge in Austin in Texas. This bridge was built in the 70s, and by 1980, bats were already moving into the expansion cracks. These are Mexican free-tailed bats, and um, at, it, at the height in the summer, one and a, one and a half million Mexican free-tailed bats live under this one bridge in the middle of the city of Austin that spans the Colorado River. When these bats fly out at night to feed, they're feeding on insect pests, 
and they can take 15 tonnes of insect pests per night, the one and a half million bats. So the farmers love them, the people of Austin love them, um, they're a tourist attraction as you can see people standing on the bridge and there are boat tours up the river to watch the bats fly out each night. But there is a problem in America. This is the little brown bat, which used to be a bat of least concern um, and quite common. But in the early 2000s, a disease started to appear in these bats. It's not really a disease. It's a fungus that grows on the bats when they're in hibernation and produces um, a syndrome. It's called white nose syndrome because the fungus grows on their mucous membranes when they're in hibernation. The fungus is called Pseudogymnoascus destructans, and it actually came, went to the USA from Europe. It's a fungus that thrives at low damp temperatures, which is caves. And because the bats are hibernating and they're at a low temperature, the fungus grows on them. These bats have gone in 10 years from being of least concern to now being endangered. Uh, the fungus has killed millions of them because what happens is they wake out of hibernation because they're irritated by the fungus. Then they can't last the winter. So the, um, the US authorities did a study to work out how much these bats are worth uh, in terms of insect control. And they came up with a figure of $4 billion a year that the bats provide uh, in terms of money that doesn't have to be spent on pesticides. So there's a lot of conservation effort going into these bats and they, I think they've stopped declining now, but it will be a long, long time because bats are a slow breeder. It'll be a long, long time before they get back to anything like reasonable numbers. And if you think vampire, what I'm, what I'm just gonna go around the world really with a few good examples of exotic bats. If you thought vampires were scary, this is them. They're, um, they're, they are weird, there's absolutely no doubt about it. It's a weird lifestyle to survive solely on blood. And they're the only mammal that is um, a parasite. In other words, it feeds on another organism without killing it. Uh, and these are, um, these, um, these are found in Central and South America. They do take blood. Some, some, there are three species, and two of the species take blood from birds, and one of the species does take blood from other mammals. They're really interesting because they have no nose and that's because they can smell where blood vessels are close to the surface. They make an incision using really sharp teeth and take um, a feed. They've got a substance in their saliva that stops the blood coagulating until they're finished feeding. And that substance has been used as the basis for a medicine to treat stroke victims, the clot, blood, clot busting drug. So that's the vampire bats. They've got that little groove there. Can you see in their chin so that they don't get blood or congealed around their, their face? They're absolutely perfectly adapted to what they do. And what a fascinating thing to think that 10 mils of blood per day can give you everything you need to live to build bone and skin and fur and give birth and do everything you need to do just from that one substance. And because vampire bats can't store much fat because there isn't much fat in blood. So they do need to feed sort of every other day at least. And, bat, and vampire bats are one of, the, uh, uh, one of the known examples of an altruistic function in mammals, whereby a bat that's found a good meal will regurgitate some of the blood to a roost mate uh, that didn't manage to find a feed that's struggling. So they're absolutely fascinating. Weird, yes. Fascinating, yes. And not scary. But of course, because of the way they feed, they can pass on rabies. But uh, vampire bats do catch rabies. Not many of them, but they do. And if, if it does have rabies, rabies is passed on via a bite. And the very way that vampire bats feed means that they could pass on rabies to the thing they're feeding on which does bring them into conflict with humans. There are bats called disc-winged bats or sucker-footed bats. They have these little pads on their wings, uh, the ends of their wings and their feet that allow them to roost in rolled up smooth leaves. It's wet adhesion that allows them to do that. They're just wonderful, aren't they? They just look like little mascots. 
And this one, I'm sure you can guess, this is called a frog eating bat. And the clever thing about this bat is it listens for the croaks of the frogs in the forest and it never tries to eat a poisonous frog because that has a different type of croak than the one it can eat. So that's the sometimes called the fringe lipped bat and you can see why that's the frog eating bat. These guys are absolutely wonderful. Look how small they are. You can see that from the thumb. These are called very well named wrinkle faced bats. This is a small fruit eating bat from Central America and it's got no top lip, can you see? And they mainly, when we say fruit eating bats, they don't, quite a lot of these species don't eat the fruit, they just chew the fruit, get the juice and spit out the pulp. And this one, uh, if it pushes its face into a ripe fruit, all the drops of juice are going to run down these wrinkles and straight into their mouth because there's no top lip there. Another wonderful thing about this bat is the male is on the left of this picture. And he, can you see that wrinkled skin around his neck? That's like a reverse hoodie and he can pull that up over his head and it's like translucent skin and covers his head. And as far as I'm aware, nobody really knows why, why he's got that. The female doesn't have it. So that's another fascinating little bat. And the wonderful thing is there's still so much we have to find out about that. They are mysterious and quite hard to study. There are tent making bats. Most bats don't make a roost. They have to find um, a place to, to roost by finding a little nook or cranny. But the tent making bat, uh, the male of a tent making bat, he will chew his way down the rib of a big palm leaf or a big leaf in the jungle till it flops over, makes a little tent. And then he'll sit in that tent and sing a song and hope that lady bats will visit him in his tent. So that's uh, these are Honduran white bats, and that will be a male with three females in the main picture. And you can see how small they are, just like little pom poms. They're absolutely brilliant bats. Only found in the tropics, and um, all the tent making bats are pale coloured because if when they're sitting under a leaf in the jungle, that anything that flies over that leaf would see the dark, a dark shape under there, but doesn't as easily see the pale shapes. And there are over 30 species of those, amazing. And then this is the last one of your uh, very whistle stop tour of bats around the world. This is the hammerhead bat. This is a West African fruit bat. And uh, I, even I know only a mother would love that face, I admit that, but you can see what people thought about these bats in the past because they called this bat Hypsignathus monstrosus. Monstrosus is like a monster. They thought he was a monster. Maybe it's just his good looks, I'm not sure. But he, the male, which is at the right there, he has a chamber in his nose that he can inflate and then trumpet, make a trumpeting sound that carries through the jungle to attract a lady hammerhead bat. So that's the hammer-headed bat. They called him a monster. He's a gentle fruit-eating bat that uh, it, uh, lives in small family groups. But the thing about the hammerhead bat is it's eaten as bush meat, and they are thought to be the reservoir for the Ebola virus. So that um, that's uh, another disease that's associated with, with bats. And I suppose I should just mention coronavirus at this point, which is thought to be another disease that came from bats. There is at the moment no direct evidence that that did happen because the SARS-CoV-2 virus has not yet been found in any wild species at all. But it is likely that it, it uh, evolved in bats. Bats have got an amazing immune system and uh, they do have a lot of diseases that don't really trouble them. But when we come into conflict with them, when we encroach on their territories and, and mix with them too closely, that's when these spillover events occur. And of course, now coronavirus is a disease of humans, uh, not a disease of bats, and it's passed on human to human. But the search for the actual source of it does go on. So that's a little bit about bats around the world. And in the UK, We've got 18 species of bats. In Northern England, we have about 10 of those breeding. So not all of them. And all our bats in the UK eat insects. They all eat insects, which they catch on the wing 
at night in the dark. And they do that by means of this wonderful thing, echolocation, where they, uh, as they fly, they're calling, they're sending out pulses of sound, which is really just shouting very loudly. And they're listening for the echoes back of everything around them, which in itself is amazing. If you try to imagine that, the sound goes out in all directions. It reflects back at different times from the things in front of it, from moths and flies and so on. And they build up in their, in their brain a sound map of what's around them. And that's how they navigate. And because of that, pictures of bats flying, they always look a bit fierce because they've always got their mouth open because that's what they're doing. They're echolocating as they fly. And because they navigate by sound, they need a lot of structure in the landscape. So British bats navigate using linear features in general. Hedgerows are very important, but things that join up the landscape are really important. Uh, uh, woodland edges and, and riverside vegetation and so on, so that bats can navigate uh, from place to place. So let's just talk about the bat year. <clears throat> so it will start with autumn because that's where we are. So in autumn is the time that bats mate. And that's quite interesting because bats mate in the autumn, but the uh, theme generally in the autumn and into winter, but gen the female bat does not get pregnant until the following spring. So she stores that sperm in her body. This is another amazing thing about bats. She stores it and then in the spring when she wakes up, if she's fit enough, she'll ovulate and that use the sperm to fertilize that. Makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Um, in the autumn, bats are also should be fattening up on the glut of insects so that they don't need to feed through the winter or not feed every day anyway. There aren't enough insects generally to sustain bats every night through the winter. So bats hibernate and they like to hibernate in cool, damp places because bats have got a lot of skin. If they hibernated in a dry atmosphere, they'd need to wake up and drink because they'd be losing moisture. So they um, hibernate in cool, damp places like caves, tunnels, bridges, and so on. Sometimes they're just hanging from the walls of caves out in the open. Sometimes they took themselves away in a cool, damp place. And, and this one found a place that wasn't quite big enough to tuck itself away. That's just the face of a brick that's coming loose in a building. Once the winter's over, bats will leave those hibernation sites and the females will go to what we call a summer roost, usually a nursery or a maternity roost, we call it. And that's female bats of a species gathering together, getting pregnant and giving birth to their young. And that, uh, as I said before, it makes a lot of sense that it's that way around for a hibernating species, because when they come out of hibernation, they're hungry and they don't really want to go think about a mate. They want to think about food. So bats will give birth usually in June and usually to a single pup. They just have one. So they breed very slowly. And because of that, they live a long time. They're quite an unusual small mammal. So you can see this is some bats tucked into a roof space. Right bang in the middle there, there's a little uh, young one. And then some of these others are adults, the, the ones with more fur. That, and we, we refer to that as a maternity roost or a nursery roost because it's mothers with young. The male bats in general live singly or in small groups and don't tend to be in the maternity roost. That's a pipistrelle pup next to a paperclip. So that's how big they are. It is a tiny little thing and it's bald without fur and so on. But it's a huge baby to a bat because the bat itself, the pipistrelle adult, weighs five grams and this weighs between one and a half and two grams. It's about a third of the mother, of the mother's size when it's born, which would be the equivalent of a human having a 40 pound baby. So it is, although it's tiny, it is quite a large baby. Occasionally they will have twins. This is a pipistrelle, the brown or pipistrelle, with twins hanging on. And those babies can hang on even when she's flying until they're a certain size, uh, after which the, they generally get left in the roost. So a summer roost, in contrast to a hibernation roost, 
is warm and dry so that the pups can be left in safety while mum's out feeding. She will come back through the night to suckle that pup. Once it's three weeks old, okay, let's go back. Once it's three weeks old, it will start to fly out and then it's got a few weeks to learn everything it needs to know before mum will stop suckling it. So on its first night out, probably doesn't catch anything and it's sort of learning the ropes as regards flying, so it might not go very far. When it gets back to the roost, mum will find it and give it a suckle. And then gradually over a period of another three or four weeks, she will, she, uh, it will learn to feed. Mum will have to feed it less often and eventually it's weaned, it's learned everything it needs to know. And then that nursery or maternity colony will disperse the uh, female, the bats go back to feeding up, ready for hibernation and mating, and then it, it all starts again. So that's the bats year. So I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the species. We're doing all right for time, I think. Uh, and I've, I've mentioned the pipistrelle. This is by far the most common bat in Britain, by far. About eight, uh, nine out of ten almost bats in the whole of the UK are pipistrel. There are two species, common pipistrel on the left and soprano pipistrel on the right. As you might imagine, the soprano pipistrel has a higher pitched echolocation call than the common pipistrel. They are very similar. There are some physical differences. The common pipistrel is a darker bat and uh, there are some other physical differences but they are very similar. The soprano pipistrel tends to form larger colonies and tends to usually be, be near water bodies, rivers and so on, whereas the common pipistrel is a bit more of a generalist. They weigh about five grams fully grown, they give birth to a single pup a year and uh, they are our most common bat. They come out first in the evening, so they're out not long after sunset and uh, it's also our smallest bat weighing about five gram both species actually if you if you weigh lots of them and measure lots of them the soprano pipistrel is ever so slightly smaller but yet they, there's not a lot of difference uh, bat to bat if you will they, they're often found in modern buildings and this is, probably this is why they've been able to hang on being our most common bat because they are quite adaptable and they take readily to built structures, quite often tucked up under the barge boards or between slates and, and roofing felt and so on. Uh, certainly in our part of the world, they like schools, uh, especially primary schools with weatherboarding and shallow roofs. Uh, we get a lot of roofs in this type of building. And of course, this is a lovely site for bats because once the children have gone home, it's nice and quiet and um, schools are always warm. <laughs> so this is, um, this is what bats look like when they're coming out. And in the summer, when the nights are very short, they only probably get four hours of darkness, there's a, quite a rush to get out and feed and get back to feed the pup. So these bats are coming, this is just filmed with a normal camera, this is not infrared. And these bats are coming out while it's still quite light, but just to let you see what they look like coming out. So these bats are coming out from um, a, the, a small boiler house that's attached to an, um, an RSPB centre in Lancashire where I live. And they found that building only two years after it was put up. And at the highest count we've ever had of bats coming out, there was 910. So it's a pretty good sign. But where were those 900 bats before that building was put up? That's an interesting one. Anyway, after the pipistrels, the next most common species uh, is the long-eared bat, the brown long-eared bat. It's got these enormous big satellite dish ears that, um, uh, and because it's got such big ears, its echolocation calls are much quieter because it hears much better. It is a woodland bat, so it, uh, and it only really comes out well after dark because it's a slow flying bat in, in contrast to the pipistrels, which come out quite early and fire away quite quickly. The long-eared bat waits till it's well dark and then it comes out and it flies low and it sticks to the shadows. It's a, much, uh, a, a different animal altogether. At rest, it curls its ears down. 
So it's um, uh, 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 they look a bit like ram's horns. This is the kind of place we'd find long-eared bats in an older house with an open roof void because they do these warm-up flights before they go out. And of course, this house, if it backs onto woodland, then it's even more popular because the, bat, uh, the bats like cover. This is the habitat for a long-eared bat. Uh, they fly slowly, so they navigate well between the trees uh, and so on. And they mainly take moths, quite often snatching them straight from the leaves of trees. And because a moth is quite a big item or can be quite a big item, a long-eared bat that's caught a big juicy moth won't eat it in flight. It will go to a perch, sometimes a favoured perch, where it can hang up and chew away. It eats the juicy bit. And as it eats the juicy bit, the wings detach and flutter to the ground. And if you find a favoured perch of long-eared bats, you'll find this scattering of moth wings along with some droppings, which is where a long-eared bat goes to eat its dinner. Some of the other species have gone through these quite quickly. Our largest bat in the UK is the nocturnal bat, generally roosting in trees, tree holes, rock holes, old woodpecker holes, that kind of thing. And it, this one comes out early at night. It, um, it's got long, narrow wings. It flies very high and fast, catches beetles and moths. And uh, this is our largest bat, and it weighs about an ounce, about 30 grams fully grown. Uh, and its wingspan is about 18 inches, 45 centimetres. This would be a, a well-used roost because the urine staining is visible and the nutrients in the urine have caused lichens and so on to, to grow up. They're not all this obvious, but we do also find nocturnes sometimes in other places in built structures. The Debenton's bat is also known as the water bat because it snatches insects from the surface of smooth water, rivers, lakes, canals. They're associated with, they fly low over the water and they've got quite large feet for a, um, a little bat and they snatch the insects using those feet. This is another picture of one I looked after this year. So this would be the habitat for um, the Benton's bats. Quite often they'd be roosting in bridges over rivers uh, and canals or trees alongside rivers and canals. This one is right on a road actually, uh, um, but it is uh, uh, just over that hedge that you can see is the canal. So it's quite a good place for the Benton's bats. And we find them in our stone structures, old stone structures as well. The Natteras bat, very closely related to the Debentons, often found in churches and other old stone buildings. Then there's a, a group of smaller bats. They're not really any bigger than pipistrels and they're quite hard to tell apart, quite enigmatic and never found in large numbers really, apart from in the north of England. The Whiskered bat, the Brant's bat, and then this one, um, the Alcathoe's bat, has been found in Yorkshire, so I did include it. And also found in Yorkshire, although not to my knowledge, certainly not in my part of the world, in Lancashire, is the Lysler's bat. This is sometimes called the lesser nocturne because it's related to the nocturne, but it's smaller. Um, it's, it, it's a little enigma to me because it's found in West Yorkshire uh, and in some places it's, it's relatively common, but we've, never, we've only ever found one in Lancashire, to my knowledge. Bit of a puzzle. And then the Nathusius pipistrel, the last one, uh, another kind of pipistrel known to migrate, so more common in the east because they come uh, across from um, uh, some of the European countries, but not common at all, really. We don't have horseshoe bats in this part of the world, as far as I know, um, they're, but uh, they're only found in Wales and the southwest. This is your typical looking. Uh, that because they do hang up like this with their wings wrapped around them and there are two species and this picture shows the difference in size the greater horseshoe on the left and the lesser horseshoe on the right when they're hanging up from the ceiling of a cave it's like a pear and a plum that's the size of them the greater horseshoe the size of a pear the lesser horseshoe the size of a plum I put a little bit in about bat detectors because people sometimes want to know about bat detectors. 
all that detecting is a compromise because you can't hear it really you can't hear it uh, and if you can hear it it's not really the noise the bat is making but there are two main ways uh, these days of listening to bats on a bat of 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 seeing bat calls or listening to bat calls a heterodyne detector these are the reasonably priced ones you can get one of these for about 65 pounds uh, and these turn these have to be tuned uh, and they, so you can only listen to one frequency at a time and they turn the bats calls echolocation calls into clicks so they're good for immediate identification once you get your earring but they, you can't analyze that because you're only tuning into one frequency at a time but they are a reasonable price and then there's a lot of full spectrum bat detectors posh stuff that go into mobile phones and tablets so this is a mobile phone the little red thing at the end it's just a very sophisticated ultrasound microphone and an app on the phone or tablet does all the clever stuff like processing the sound and giving you a sonogram. Can you see the sonogram there on that little screen? So they're much more sophisticated. They use your tablet or your phone to uh, do the processing and store the calls and so on. But you can't hear anything. So the problem with those is that instead of watching the bats, which is the fun thing to do, you're looking at a little screen because you're fascinated by what it's telling you. And they're about £200, the cheapest of them. Now, bats declined a lot through the 20th century for all the reasons we know. Remedial timber treatment was quite a bad one, killed a lot of bats in the past. Of course, we've got, I'll go through these a bit quicker because I think I'm running out of time. We lost a lot of our woodland through the 20th century. We intensified our land use. So these, some of these fields are huge. There's no hedgerows, there's no ponds. They're sprayed to get rid of insect pests. And so we don't um, have bats there. Allen, the dreaded Allen, artificial light at night is um, the pain of my life really. Uh, and if you think about it, we need to get a bit smarter with light at night because this particular picture that lights just lighting up the top of two street trees and where people walk is still dark it's ridiculous it disturbs wildlife and we need to get smarter with our artificial light at night wind turbines can kill bats i'm sure you've read about that kind of thing and there are various reasons why that happens and Hopefully the wind turbine companies are open to making adjustments that will stop a lot of that happening. And then there's a new threat that we really don't know how much of a threat with modern roof membranes that are polypropylene, they're not a woven fabric and they're, um, they're quite a new material. They've only been out about 15 years, I think. And if bats get onto that material and start to pluck out the fibres, they can get tangled in it. Uh, and die. Uh, even if you don't care about the bats, that's a problem because the manufacturers have given you a 25 year guarantee because it's breathable and then it's got dead bats on it and it's not breathable anymore. So bats were protect first protected by law 40 years ago this year. There are quite severe penalties. You can be arrested, you can have unlimited fines and so on, get your equipment. Uh, and these are the things that are illegal. You mustn't capture or kill a bat, disturb a bat, damage or destroy the resting place of a bat or keep a bat. And when the first law came in, uh, bat groups sprung up to sort of take advantage of that protection and work to find out where bats were. So we do lots of things like bat box schemes. We go out with bat detectors looking for new roosts. We monitor some of our bat box schemes. We try to protect key sites and habitats. And we do roost visits. So we work on behalf of Natural England, but as volunteers, we go out to households where there's a bat problem or perceived problem. And we try to work with the householder to solve the problem or to reassure them that it isn't really a problem. Uh, in this case, this lady, it's, this is quite a new house, but it's stone faced. And the bats were coming out all over that building because the, the stone face had gaps behind it. She wasn't worried apart from the one that was here above her bedroom window because when they flew out of that little gap, they weed on her window. So in the end, we could easily solve that by doing a, a little bit of pointing once the bats had left so they can come back to all the places except for the one that caused her the grief. 
we try to work with the building industry to um, get more awareness. And there is a lot more awareness in my 20 odd years than, than um, now. Builders are very often quite keen to stop work as soon as there's um, a, a sniff of a bat because they uh, realise that it's an offence. And there are things that can be put into new buildings to accommodate bats. Um, and these are especially popular in new buildings like colleges and light industrial buildings. Uh, where you can put these uh, bricks that bats can use. Gail, we're running out of time. Yes, yes, I'm going quickly. So, um, people Very quickly, bats... please. Pardon? Very quickly, please. Yes. Okay, well, I can skip this bit if you like. Uh, some of the things you can do to help bats are indirect. You're doing things that will... Um, attract more insects to your garden. So wildflowers, flowers that smell at night like honeysuckle, ponds are great, and bat boxes are always a good thing. Thank you. <laughs>